So we continue our analysis of the book of Jeremiah, and as you see, in the process we keep learning all kinds of interesting things. I just want to remind you, brethren, that uh, the books of the prophets are based on the first five books in the Bible. In the first five books in the Bible, God has given us the laws, regulations that really make our lives happy, or if we break those regulations and those laws, then our lives become filled with curses. And the prophets continued later, as God sent them to both houses of Israel, to the house of Judah, and to the house of the ten tribes, to the house of to the house of Joseph, or house of Ephraim, rather. The prophets continued to warn those two nations, God's nations, of the consequences of the breaking of God's law. So, basically, here is Jeremiah, who is basically primarily sent to the house of Judah, but in his books, as you have seen already, and you'll be seeing in until the end of this book, we see also the prophecies about other nations and also the prophecies about the ten tribes. So now in chapter 5, verse 1, God says to Jeremiah, Run to and throw through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, and seek in her open places, if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Now, brethren, these open places in this verse are actually marketplaces, public places where many people gather. And they're open places of trade. So God says to Jeremiah, look all over the town, in other words. That's what he says. You know, just go look over all over the town. Look at the markets. Look at the narrow streets on the outskirts. Every way you can look at it, you know, if you can find a man who is righteous. And this verse harkens back to what God said about Sodom and Gomorrah and how he would spare those towns if there be a certain number of righteous men. It also harkens back to the time of the flood. You see, God's principle has always been that if there are enough righteous in a place, he will spare it. If there is not, he'll take the righteous out of such place and destroy it. That is what he has always done, be that Sodom and Gomorrah, be that the flood, or any other time. God does not destroy the righteous with the wicked, brethren. That certainly has always been his principle. Now, in order to execute judgments, we need to know what God's judgments are. They're justice, they're equitable, they're fair. Someone that seeks the truth, and then God would pardon the place just for the one individual. Verse 2, though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. So here again, he typifies the people of Jerusalem as religious, you see. They swear by God, you know, as the Lord lives, but brethren, they swear falsely. Verse 3, O Lord, are not you your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. See, God keeps calling them to return. Return to him. Return, O rebellious house of Judah, O rebellious house of Israel. But they keep refusing it, brethren. You see, they did not feel the pain. You see, a nation can be stricken and they will not admit that it is because of immorality, because of going away from God. We can see how a nation stricken with volcanic eruptions and weird weather, droughts and crazy rains and extremes and unbalanced weather, we can see that. I mean, now every winter it seems there is an extreme cold in one of these rare countries, be that the Great Britain, United Kingdom or the United States of America. Or any other nation God can strike, indeed. So, you know, God can strike them. But that does not even pain them. They don't recognize it. They would say, oh, we are just in another cycle. Or, oh, we all have ups and downs. Or, these things always come and go. And, you know, or we have all gotten out of our troubles before. This is not the first time that we are going through all those and so on. Those are usually human arguments. So this is the attitude that God says will be there, indeed. And it is there. Now, you have consumed them. 
You have consumed them, says this verse. They have not grieved and you have consumed them. So they can die by thousands and millions in wars, through violence and all kind of corruption, but they don't associate it with that with God, brethren. They don't associate it with the way they live or with anything else. Their faces are harder than a rock. So usually if someone suffers and they don't associate it with wrong, then they get harder and tougher and more grizzled. And therefore, says verse 4, Therefore I said, Surely these are poor. They are foolish. For they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. So they would never attribute any difficulties to any judgment from God. They don't even know the way of God. Now in the next few chapters, we'll see how the prophet vividly describes the Christianity that took the name of Christ and put it all over paganism and they call it Christian. They don't know the way of the eternal. They're foolish, they're poor, reduced in their means, impoverished. Verse 5, I'll go to the, to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. So since the average men do see or recognize what is going on, check with the rich and the powerful. Check with the politicians, the leaders, millionaires, and see if they recognize anything. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. In other words, they likewise have forgotten all about God and together with one accord, they have all broken the yoke and burst the bonds. So then God pictures what is going to come upon them. Here again, he pictures the world empires by animals and birds. Verse 6, Therefore a lion from the forest shall slay them, a wolf of the deserts shall destroy them, a leopard will watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, their backslidings have increased. Now, of course, the lion was Babylon, the leopard was Alexander the Great's time, wolf is just a devouring night creature described here, and we have here a mistranslated word, brethren, it is not transgressions, it is much worse word in Hebrew, it is pasha, which means revolt, rebellion, revolt and rebellion, stubborn, callous, revolting, rebellious, lawless attitude, not just transgressing, stepping beyond the law, no, because of all of that, their backslidings, in Greek it would be called apostasis, or falling away if you wish in English, their backslidings or apostasies have increased, so they are very severe in number and wretchedness. Verse 7, how shall I pardon your, you for this? Your children have forsaken me, and sworn by those that are not gods, and I have fed them to the full. Then they committed adultery, and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. So here he goes back again to what people worship. They worship all kinds of idols and the way of men and the ways of the heathen. Now, when we hit the, you know, peak of our prosperity, when God has fed us to the full, then when people lost their national drive and national aim, then what happens? Well, you turn to morality or immorality. You turn to materialism and flesh. And they assembled by troops in the harlots' houses, which is a good description of how pornography has popped up everywhere, including domestic reality shows in which adultery is the main theme. It is a good description of all immorality that has prevailed in our society. Verse 8. They were like well-fed lusty stallions. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. The horses are usually fed, they're usually well fed in the morning and then they have their full strength. Anyway, 
God prophesied that people will lose their loyalty to their mates as well as devotion and dedication to their own mates. Instead, everybody goes by sight and everybody thinks they're entitled to somebody else. So, of all the descriptions in the Bible of sexual immorality, that is the most vivid one of all. It says, Assembled by troops in the harlots' houses, well-fed lusty stallions, everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. Now God says in verse 9, Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? You know, brethren, they don't do that in a lot of nations around the world. But they certainly do that in Norway, in Sweden, and in England and America. They do that in Israel. And God says, shall I not punish them for these things? So even though you swear by God's name, look at the way you live. You say you're a Christian. You say you're the Christian nations. You say that God is with you and we, you pray and ask God to deliver your captives and everything else. But look at the way you live. Verse 10, go up on her walls and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Take away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. Now, we know there will be a remnant of the house of Israel after they have been chastened fully. Instead of depending on God for their protection, the modern house of Israel brethren, is depending on themselves and their allies and of their lovers and everything else. So God says, go and look at Americans' walls of defense. What they trust in, what is their security, what are their sins. It's their weaponry, their lovers, but they're not the Eternals. Verse 11, for the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. So we see at the time of this end time, national calamity, at the time of this sexual immorality and all the things going on, there are still two separate houses. They didn't come back as one in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. They did not combine over in Assyria and in, in Babylon. There are still the two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Jacob. In verse 12, they've lied about the Lord and said, it is not one. Neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword of famine. You see, they have been deceitful, brethren. They swear they're Christian, and yet look at the way they live. They say no evil will come upon us, neither we will see the sword and the famine. So there have been always the false prophets that contradict the true prophets, and they say, no, that is not going to happen to us. Well, isn't it ridiculous to say that America is cursed, we are the most blessed and prosperous nation in the world, people want to come here from everywhere. Well, who can say we are under the curse and that we are going down and will be going to come up and, we, and no evil is going to come up against us, you know, no evil is going to come upon us. We are not going to see sword and famine you know, that's what the false pro prophets and false preachers tell you. And they'll be probably saying that when the foreign occupiers will be dragging them off, you know, it will be like in the days of Noah. Flood, you know, don't be crazy, brethren. We never had much rain at all, much less a flood in this place. <laughs> they would say, you know. Verse 13. And the prophets become become wind. For the word is not in them, thus shall it be done to them. Therefore says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I'll make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Now the same curse is mentioned in chapter 15, verse 16, chapter 35, verse 17, and chapter 49, verse 5. So it's mentioned, you know, the same curse, so it is uh, mentioned four times in this book. No, it is not coincidence, it is exactly on purpose that we find it four times. You see, God likens the sayings of the people as being, you know, like fire. 
it will devour people that are wood. Verse 15, because, Behold, I'll bring a nation against you from afar. O house of Israel, says the Lord, it is a mighty nation, it is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Well, it all goes goes all the way back to Babylon, chapter 10, Babylon. Uh, not Babylon, I mean, it all goes back to Babylon in Genesis, chapter 10. It is the same Babylonian power, the old Roman resurrected empire, still a part of old Nebuchadnezzar's system. So it is not a new nation, but it is an ancient nation. It is a mighty nation, and it is, it is far. They don't know the language of that nation, which means that the future occupiers of the Anglo-Saxon world, brethren, do not speak English. They're a nation with their own language. So, they don't know the language. It's a nation from afar. Nevertheless, it's the same Babylonian power, the old Roman resurrected empire, still a part of old Nebuchadnezzar's system. So it's not a new nation, you might say, but it's an ancient nation. It is a mighty nation, and it's coming from afar. You see, they don't know the language of that nation, which means that the future occupiers, again, of the Anglo-Saxon world, they do not speak English. They're a nation with their own language, indeed. And in the Slavic world, we call that nation dumb people, people of no speech. Because their language to us sounds like a language of no speech. <laughs> uh, German, so yes indeed, the, the, the German language indeed. So not only the Anglo-Saxons don't speak their language, they are not like them in their talk even. The Anglo-Saxons do not think like their occupiers, they have a different mentality indeed. Verse 16 their, their quiver is like an open tomb. They are all mighty men. And they shall eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and daughters should eat. They shall eat up your flo flocks and your herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities in which you trust with the sword. Now, speaking of eating up your harvest and uh, your bread, which your sons and daughters should eat, Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 17 speaks of the same and ties all these prophecies together. They're all speaking the same language. Verse 18. Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you. In other words, you know, in those days, brethren, well, no phrase, well known phrase to us, in that day, in those days, there will be a remnant. A uh, well known phrase that we read in the Bible over and over and over again. So it's always that good news. Even though Israel will have to be decimated in numbers, there is still going to be a certain number of them. Verse 19. And it will be when you say, Why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? Then you shall answer them, Just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that is yours. So you see, they're not going to understand all that. Now we are a Christian nation. Why is God going to punish Christian nation first. That will be the reasoning. You know, it likes, like he is going to first punish the Oriental nations, heathen. Looks like he's going to smite those Arab Muslims, you know, but no, he smites Christians first. So they are going to say, why did you do that to us? Why us? Well, look at the way you live. Shall I not punish for all these teachings? Look at what you are doing. You know, I've got to punish you first because you claim to be Christians and look at the way you live. Then when I punish you for your wickedness, then will I punish those others. Now, brethren, in modern Israel, 
has gone the way of Baalism and all kind of paganism. They have forsaken God and turned to foreign gods. You brought strange gods into my mind. I am going to send you to those lands where those gods came from. You want to serve them? Let me just turn you over to serve them and send you to the lands whose those gods come from. Verse 20. Declare, this is the house of Jacob, and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not. Well, this shows again, but in the blindness of the house of Israel. There are people who should know their God. They are descendants of the people of the Bible, but their eyes, with their eyes, brethren, they do not see. So their eyes don't see, and their ears don't hear. And then we notice another thing. They don't fear God, you know. Verse 22. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? We have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it. And although it waves, toss and throw, yet they cannot prevail. Though the roar, yet they cannot pass over it. You well, see, many of the world's religions don't want to have any fear. Yet the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. That reverence and awe, when we read the Bible, is necessary to have wisdom and understanding. In this verse, God also speaks about his prophecies again. Verse 23, But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. Now, verse 24, they do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord God. Who grieves, who gives rain, both to the former and to the latter, in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Verse 25, your iniquity. Uh, verse 25, your iniquity have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They live in, in, in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap, they catch them. As a cage is full of birds, some so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great in growth and growth in rich. Verse 29, they have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surprise the dead of the wicked. And uh, they do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper. And the right of the needy they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. Verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? What will you do in the end? A very good question indeed.